with Lowell. I am your host, Lowell Thompson. This podcast is first and foremost about learning. We will learn about the different avenues for success in biotech, healthcare, and related science fields through conversations with startups, researchers, and policymakers, CEOs, experts, you name it. We're going to have it on this podcast so you can learn about the different ways people are achieving things in the industry and how you can do the same. Or just learn about great science topics. I consider there are two main types of episodes. The first type is what I consider a case study or mini biographies where I communicate with a person about a specific topic, usually what they're trained in or have experience in, so you can get a sense of who they are, what they do, and what they're passionate about. And it usually comes with a a lot of advice at the end. The second type is a symposium topic, or a group topic where I interview a bunch of guests around a central theme, such as like how to get venture capital for a biotech company, how to affect change in Congress. That's going to be a fun one. How to eradicate an illness. Tune in every Monday for email blasts if you've signed up for them at my website, Learning with Lowell, to get book recommendations, website recommendations. I mean, really, you're going to get a lot of content from that every Tuesday for new episodes. And every Thursday, I'm going to do a blog post as well. And we have a Facebook, a Twitter. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn. Basically, device connects to the internet. You'll be able to get these podcasts. Please leave a review and tell everyone, please and thank you. Today, we are joined by David Bader, Director of Education at the Aquarium of the Pacific out in California. He looks at stopping animals from going to extinct, managing education and public programs, looking at long-term planning and staffing. We talk about porpoises and how they have a population, a specific species of porpoises have a population of about 30, which he's working on conservating and working to keep around, which is really great. So keep it, the, the things you're going to get from this are conservation, how to keep things from going extinct, the work he's done to do both of those things, and the, how he got where he is. Those are some of the key things you're going to get from this conversation, and much, much more. Working with the porpoises, what are, what are the key things that you've been doing to ensure that the 30 that are still in the Mexican region, if I'm remembering correctly, are that the population grows instead of decreasing? Well, I, I, I wish I had a, a better story to tell. but um, So I, I participate in something called uh, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, uh, and a specific program that they ha- have called saving animals from extinction or safe. Uh, and in particular, I work on uh, public engagement for the vaquita porpoise. Uh, the vaquita is a porpoise that it lives only in the upper region of the Sea of Cortez um, in a really tiny little space. It's a population that at its maximum probably was never more than a few thousand animals. And today it's less than 30. Um, vaquitas suffer from being entangled in a type of fishing net called a gill net. And the fishermen up there are actually not trying to catch vaquita. For for decades, they were trying to catch uh, shrimp um, to export to the United States um, in our markets here, uh, as well as a a fish called the totuaba. Uh, The totuaba has a a part of its body called a swim bladder that, when it's dried out, uh, is used as a soup, medicinal soup in in China. It can fetch a really high price. Um, The totuaba now, because it was exploited for so many decades for its swim bladder, is also an endangered so we have this really um, complex situation in the upper Gulf where the fishermen there are using gill nets to really just make a subsistence living to, to earn their livelihood. And in the process, um, you know, they're exporting a product to you know, foreign countries and the consumers of those products really don't know the impacts that they're having on new species. And unfortunately for the vaquita, um, it means that they're, you know, very close to extinction. My role in this has been to help people to know that that the vaquita exists in the world. Um, I think, you know, extinction can't happen in the, in a vacuum, in the dark. People need to understand the impacts that they have on the world um, and to understand that the things that we do have consequences um, and the choices that we make. And in particular for seafood purchasing and pretty much, you know, food in general, um, has a huge impact on the planet and helping people to understand that relationship, that the choices that they make uh, in their you know, food purchases and their energy um, have really serious consequences. And for the vaquita, um, it's causing the near extinction. Talking about the aspect of picking the right food, are there good rules of thumb or organizations that people can follow to have a better sense of what is because when you go to the supermarket, like how do you how, how do you tell right what's what's properly sourced and what's not properly sourced? It's important for people to be informed consumers. I mean, I think that's kind of what we would all hope for is that people would would take you know any small amount of effort to make a you know an informed choice when they make their purchase. And I think that would be true for 
you know, the car that you drive, the house that you buy, or, you know, the food that you eat. So, you know, for seafood in particular, um, I think, you know, what people could do is just get on the internet, and search sustainable seafood, and um, they'll find any number of different programs that have various ways of being able to select the most sustainable seafood. I, I like to give people those, those kinds of options to see what works best for them and which uh, organization they align with the most. Uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific has uh, aligns with NOAA's uh, uh, Sustainable Seafood Program, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium has a food um, sustainability program. You know, Shedd Aquarium does, National Aquarium does. So most, most of the large uh, aquariums have, have various programs for helping you to identify seafood sustainability. A general rule of thumb, though, I think, is to buy U.S. I think um, it's easy for people to kind of get into the idea of buying local or supporting uh, U.S. fishermen. And if you're doing that, you're actually supporting uh, some of the, the highest and most stringent uh, seafoods regulations that exist in the world. And, you know, our, our tax dollars go to support that and our, our morals and values are placed upon those fisheries to maintain healthy fisheries and healthy fish stocks, but also to help to maintain, um, you know, the livelihoods of, of the fishermen that are out there working to, to make their living and to supply us with a really healthy product um, in seafood. So rule of thumb would be buy U.S., uh, uh, and then after that, do a little bit of research. It doesn't take much. Someone who focuses so much on educating people, do you have book recommendations that seem to be, or at least you feel are effective on kind of giving people a good primer or like good start to thinking about these things? You know, for um, for seafood sustainability, I, I don't. I, I generally think that um, the resources are out there through, um, through you know, the, the fishery service, through NOAA. Uh, through our website, we have a, a great program that people can check out called um, Storied Seafood. Uh, we just came out or will be coming out with a new um, Storied Seafood to talk all about the industry, the fishermen, and, and gives a different perspective on, on what people can um, can learn and understand about how seafood makes its way to, to your table. Um, so I think that that's one thing that you do. But um, yeah, outside of... Uh, of, of you know, kind of the, the websites that, that provide information. I think that's the best place to, to begin with. Um, one of the best things that anybody could do is to go make a relationship with um, with the fishermen themselves. Uh, there's a number of, if you, especially if you're lucky enough to live coastally, um, you can you can head down to places where uh, the fishermen are actually offloading their catch, and you know those those seafood counters and whatnot are are some of the best places to learn about sustainability and to, to learn about how that food made its way to your plate. Uh, places here in, in the Los Angeles area, in the Central Coast, up in Monterey, uh, San Francisco, all have these kind of opportunities for, uh, for really getting to know where your food comes from. And I think people can get that if you think about the whole movement towards you know, local organic produce and, and buying the farmer's market and all of that kind of stuff. If we can extend that idea to, to our fisheries as well and to buy in, right? Um, 80 to 90 percent of the seafood that we consume is imported. It comes from foreign countries, from places far away that don't have the same type of regulation and protections necessarily that the, our local uh, seafood does. So, so really understanding that and, and you know taking on the initiative of, of you know buying within season and getting to know where your food comes from. Those are all really great things people what are the things that we're doing currently to help out those populations you mentioned two different species like what other than dealing with the fish nets and talking to the fisher fishermen and, and women what are the things that has been going on to kind of like promote that because with such a small population size is there any inbreeding concerns yeah so a, a couple questions there i think one of the um the biggest and easiest things that people can do is to help to build and raise awareness about extinction. Um, and, you know, I think if you were to say extinction, people probably think about, you know, rhinos in Africa or tigers in Asia. Uh, but the idea of, of ocean animals being part of that, um, that story is, is sort of new. And, and we have to understand that our ability to, to access the ocean, extract resources from it is, is building in its capacity and that has impacts on the wildlife that's there. So a lot of the story that's been told about animals on, 
on land is beginning to have the same sort of effects uh, in the ocean. So it, it's a new story for us to tell and think about and really wrap our heads around. Uh, you know, so for giving a sense of hope for, for these species, I think, you know, there, there is tremendous capacity in people's uh, passion, will. Um, and I always have hope that, you know, when people find something that's important to them, um, and find something to be important, then they can make positive choices and, and help to make a difference. One way to start doing that is to, to share, to spread the word, uh, to let people know what's happening. And from that, I think action can happen. Uh, I always like to say, you know, if someone asks me, do you have hope for the vaquita? I will reply that, that I have hope if you will act. Uh, if, if you're not willing to do anything, then we have little or less hope. But if you're willing to do something, share, uh, write a letter, uh, make a donation. If you're willing to do that, then there is hope because hope is, is something that requires action. It requires people to get behind it. He also asked a, a question about uh, inbreeding and in the, in the population being small. Uh, what's lucky for the vaquita and, and where there's hope in that is the vaquita have been a small population for probably a few million years. Uh, so all the vaquita are very closely related to one another. Um, and so those problems of inbreeding have probably been worked out in the genetics already. Uh, and that idea of sort of buildup of deleterious genes and whatnot that can come from in inbreeding is probably less of a problem for a vaquita than it might be for, for some other species. Right now, uh, that's not a, a, a big concern. Um, really, the, the concern for the vaquita is now illegal gill nets. For, for the vaquita in particular, um, I think it's really about thinking about our, our imports um, because the, you know, writing your congressman or senator, you know, for, for our, our fisheries that we have here in the United States, uh, we have really robust regulation. Uh, and so the concern is really more about the, the types of seafoods and other products that we bring into the country and the standards by which uh, those are being caught. And I think if people were to uh, want to act and, and to build awareness about these things, really, you know, questioning um, what's the best way to engage in, in helping to change seafood practice globally. Um, and, and that would be the biggest thing is to really engage in, in a really tough conversation, which, uh, you know, it's not going to have an easy answer. It's going to be difficult to figure out ways to establish, you know, sustainable fisheries practices around the world um, and, you know, making sure that everybody's, uh, you know, earning a fair wage for, for work that's done, you know, and, and also doing their work in a way that lets them be able to do that work for a very long time. It doesn't deplete natural resources. Uh, all of that is very complex, but somebody has to think about it and the work has to start. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like the national parks, right? Like don't, you got to keep, you got to work to keep the beauty around or else you'll like have some capitalist company coming in and like trying to like strip mine it or something like that. So are there, are there big like water na national parks? You know, if that makes sense, maybe that's. Yeah, no, no, there, there absolutely is. Um, the, one of the, the largest uh, in the, in the world is the Papa Hanao Mokuakea National Monument. <laughs> which is a uh, shorthand for that is the Northwest Hawaiian Islands National Monument. Um, actually, President uh, George W. Bush, um, one of his last acts as president was to establish uh, a very, very large marine protected area around the Northwest Hawaiian Island chains. Um, and, and, you know, that's an amazing uh, achievement. And, you know, right now, our national monuments and, and, and those those that have been established by, by presidential decree are, are being reconsidered right now. Um, so one of the things people can do is, is also let, you know, if they have strong feelings about um, having protected spaces, spaces in the ocean um, to, to make sure that, you know, they have their voice heard about that. There's also uh, a series of marine protected areas along the coast of California. California, uh, you know, being maybe the progressive place that it is, created something called the Marine Life Protection Act. And from that, a set of uh, a series of marine protected areas that um, are all up and down the coast of California now. It's relatively new legislation and, uh, you know, it's been in place for a few years. But, but the idea of setting aside places in the ocean, just like we do on land, 
um, is an important one for, for people to consider. I always think of like the effects of things. So it, it, I wish the, I'm sure we all wish that the, the parks were put in place longer ago so we can kind of see how the effects on the populations have been. Have there, maybe this is just a, no, there's too little time, but as with these parks put in place, has there been any effects on the populations that you're aware of that have been noteworthy? I think some of it is, uh, is too early to tell. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, you know, I, I, there, I know there has been a study done. Um, and in the back of my mind, I'm remembering that, you know, there, there are seemingly positive outcomes that are coming from it, but we're also talking about animals that can be really long lived. Um, uh, you know, like a, a giant sea bass with species of, of concern in, in California, one that was depleted by overfishing can live to be 75 years old or older. Certain rockfish also protected or not protected, but here in the California coast can live, you know, over a hundred years. The oldest living fish is a rockfish uh, that was actually caught and killed. Uh, and then you can read their, their inner ear bones uh, to sort of read them like a tree ring. And that fish was over 200 years old. Uh, it was living healthy fish at 200 years um, old. So, you know, animals can, in the ocean can, can be fairly long lived and, and to see those species recover going to take some time it's more of a comment i did not know sea bass live that long i thought they would for some reason i thought they would live for only like 20 years that's interesting yeah well you know sea bass is a, is a general term for a lot of different things um so mm -hmm. giant sea bass is actually a, a type of fish called a wreck fish um so it's it's not a it's not a sea bass really at all it just kind of looks oh okay it seems the seems like water in the ocean is very calming or something like keeps the cortisol levels down because there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of long-lived uh, animals out there. What? So I don't. Have you ever seen? If you ever seen the movie Lilo and Stitch, there's like a fish called Pudge. Okay. the The question I'm asking is, have have you directly contributed to like uh, a fish like that, like, and you named it kind of like Pudge, and then you've like seen it grow over the years? Because you've been at the aquarium, I believe you said for 20 years. So I'm kind of curious. Has there been something that you've seen develop? Because I think that's always really rewarding to see the effects of your actions, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, uh, so not, not me directly. I, so as uh, always working in the education department here, we have a, a staff that, that actually is responsible for uh, the care and uh, upkeep of our, of our animal exhibits and the animals that are in them. Uh, but uh, I do have a fun story about uh, an octopus that um, – it only lived for two years. That's that's kind of a normal lifespan for an octopus. But this uh, this octopus's name was Lucky Sucker. Uh, it, it was found uh, a couple miles inland um, on the street by Pacific Coast Highway uh, over by uh, Long Beach Community College. And a good Samaritan picked it up, put it on his notepad, and brought it to the aquarium uh, where we were were able to just barely uh, revive it, right? It, it was out of water for so long, but it survived. And it became um, our, our classroom ambassador animal. And uh, octopuses have personalities. Some of them are very shy and reserved, and, and some of them are very outgoing. And it turns out that Lucky Sucker was, was of the outgoing variety. Um, and we would uh, put him in his, uh, his enclosure and uh, have him you know, be in, in part of the room where they see him, but he would peek his head around the corner. Uh, and I swear he would peek his head around the corner and, and observe the kids in the class. And if you open the lid of the tank, he would come right up to the top and start pushing his arms out to feel around and say hello. And we would give him puzzles uh, like jars with food inside and, and whatnot to, to learn how to open. And I always tell that story about Lucky Sucker because uh, octopuses are just amazing animals. Uh, they have uh, personalities. We know that, you know, dogs and cats and birds, some of those animals are, are just familiar to us. And then we think about dolphins and sea lions. And they sort of behave in a way that we sort of expect an animal to behave that has a personality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't usually think about invertebrates, you know, things that are relatives of clams to have a, a personality uh, and to be interactive in the way that that lucky sucker was. Um, so fond memories of, of that particular octopus. I'm a big I'm a big lover of cephalopods myself, so that's I, I I like that story. You know, I don't know how did he get on the road? Like that's he, he probably crawled out of somebody's bucket. Uh, maybe someone was you know collected him out of the tide pool or whatever, and he uh, crawled out. Well, it's good that he found a home. I always think it's weird that cephalopods are seem to have short lives, even though they're really smart. You know, you think the 
they'd live longer. I, I agree with you. It's um, I think as people, we try to think about the world in terms of ourselves and we relate to the world um, or try to relate the world in terms of, of how a human being relates to the world. And I think that's that's probably almost always a mistake um, that, you know, life on, on the earth has been around for a number of billions of years and, and we've only been here for, you know, a few hundred thousand of that that whole time. And there's just an amazing diversity and variety of ways that um, living things do what they do. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I love being a marine biologist and love, you know, studying the ocean is there's always something amazing to be learned. You know, 95% of the world ocean is completely unexplored. As soon as, as soon as you stick your face in the water, you, we really don't know anything. Um, you know, we know a lot, but there's so much more to be learned uh, and discovered. And that's what, that's what really draws me to the field, um, is that sense of exploration and that sense that just around the corner, you know, whatever the ocean version of around the corner would be, there's going to be a, an amazing discovery. Um, and certainly there are still many amazing discoveries left. You could sink China in the Pacific and we, you wouldn't really miss it. You know, like that's creepy. You know, like uh, it's there's so much there that we don't know, which makes me I don't know how people swim in the middle of the ocean. It's like there's like 500 feet down and you don't know even what's there. What if there's like something staring at you? I don't know. These are like paranoid thoughts I have. I've not had to go to the ocean. So average ocean depth is a little over two miles. So uh... that's crazy. How did you know that you wanted to be a director of education? How did you know yeah. that that was for you? Like of all the things you could do, study cephalopods. Yeah. What are why did why did you choose that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so all throughout uh, growing up, I, I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist. I was one of those people who was inspired by Jacques Cousteau, um, not to, you know, swim on a dolphin's back, but really to explore the ocean. I loved that idea of you know getting on a ship and going out into the, in the unexplored and jumping in and seeing what, what you could see. And that's kind of where my mind was all, all throughout elementary school, middle school, high school, and into college. And, and then no one really ever counseled me to say that uh, being a marine biologist is not really a career. It's more of a field of study. and You have to figure out what to do with that degree uh, once you graduate. And I think, uh, you know, I volunteered over at, a, at the aquarium on the Santa Monica Pier. Uh, it used to be called the UCLA Ocean Discovery Center when I was there, but I think it's called the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium now. And, uh, and I just discovered that what I really loved doing was was talking was to engage with people in a way that got them as excited about the ocean as I was, um, and that's that's where I kind of fell into the idea that I that talking to people, uh, you know, about this thing that I found to be so amazing was what I was good at and what I really liked doing. So I started working here at the Aquarium of the Pacific almost right out of college, and uh, I've been here ever since. No regrets. No regrets. No, none at all. After twenty years, I hope not. <laughs> like you should know like maybe you're five you're like oh maybe this isn't for me you're yeah. 15 you should probably have course corrected you're 20 you know where you belong yeah you know it's, it's not like i was i've been doing the same thing this whole time right so you know new 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 jobs new areas of growth and one of the things that shifted for me in that time frame was um to recognize that while i really loved the direct connection with people and and having that interface and and I also liked, uh, really liked helping others to achieve this job. So becoming a, a manager and a supervisor of, of staff and helping them to grow in their careers and to uh, to see them grow and prosper and, and help to uh, engage people in in, uh, in marine education, uh, I found that I loved that almost as much as as, as doing it directly, and I, and that felt that fit nicely with uh, moving up in, in the institution. It's always good to give back, right? Like, cause then it's like the tides. Like, you gotta, they gotta come again. You gotta do them right, or else the tide won't come back. That's a horrible analogy. I don't know why I picked the tides. That is, that takes no effort. The moon just sits there. <laughs> it, it was working for a little while. It was. Uh, we'll yeah. work on it. Yeah, yeah. I gotta work on my analogies, but it's good. But did you have mentorship when? You, because you, no one really kind of guided you early on. But like maybe mid career, did you have any key mentors? Yeah, sure. Um... I certainly did. I mean, uh, one of, you know, a few examples of, of professors that I had, uh, I, I didn't have a really close connection, but one of my favorite professors at university level was uh, my calculus professor. And, and I hate math, uh, 
but this gentleman took teaching calculus with a passion, uh, with a, you know, a real desire to help everybody in the class to understand the subject. And I think I learned from him um, that, you know, if you're passionate about something, then you can share that with others and it'll help them to be passionate about it as well. And I had a, a similar uh, professor, um, she was, her name was Mary Silver, um, who studied plankton. And her enthusiasm for engaging uh, with her, her students uh, was really transformative and helped me to, to grow in that capacity as well. Um, you know, and then, you know, throughout my time here, I've had been lucky enough to have a, a number of bosses that have been uh, really supportive of me to grow um, and, and really gave me the opportunity to, to be in the place that I am today. Are there any more mountains, like on a personal level, that you've yet to climb that you are looking forward to or that you want to climb? One of the things that the story of the Vaquita has sort of taught me. Uh, the lessons I've learned from that is our approach to marine conservation is somewhat skewed towards thinking that the only way to achieve our goals is through uh, restrictions and enforcement. And, and those, those actions can help, uh, but they're largely unsuccessful. Um, and working with and through people, stakeholders at the, at the grassroots of, of the root of the problems is really the only way to move forward successfully in, in conservation. So, you know, this, this different idea that um, social science is probably the cornerstone to a successful conservation project. Uh, and to spread that a little bit more broadly is something that I would like to better understand. And the second is to, to better understand the role of aquariums in, in species conservation. Uh, I think aquariums have been really great at introducing people to uh, ocean animals and ocean spaces that are completely unfamiliar to people. Um, and that's been a really important and key role that aquariums have played. But, you know, when we think about zoos, um, I think one of the, the thoughts that comes to our mind is species conservation, right? When you think about the zoo, you're thinking about the endangered species that they have in their collection and the conservation, field conservation efforts that those zoos might be engaged in, you know, in Africa or South America or, you know, Indonesia or something like that. Uh, when you think of aquariums, I'm not sure that that's what comes to mind. Um, and I feel like that is a shift that, that we need to make as aquariums to to better understand the role that we might need to play in ocean species conservation and field conservation. You know, we, we probably need to have programs that are similar to the programs that you have in Africa for rhino and cheetah and lion. We need to have those for you know, vaquita and Irrawaddy dolphin, finless porpoise, um, Franciscana dolphin. Pretty much any coastal cetacean um, is, is struggling right now from you know, interacting with coastal fishery. And we need to find better ways of, of addressing those issues, um, but doing it in a way that will be most effective, working with the stakeholders, the people who are engaged in those fisheries to help them to have a sustained, uh, you know, livelihood, supporting themselves and their families, but also doing so in a way that, um, you know, is sustainable environmentally. And those are some key areas that I would like to address not just for my own institution and myself, but broadly with our community of, of Zinaquari. No, definitely. It's, there's, you know, there's a top-down approach where you go from like, you know, Congress or government down, but if you can get everyone at the local level to agree and see the issue, then, and you have like exactly what you're saying, the stakeholders involved, well, then you, right. you, you can make it hard to say no to you. You know what I mean? Like if you go, when you eventually get to that level where you start talking about regulation and stuff and you say, hey, all these people are on board, you know, it's kind of like, how do you not join us? You know, like it makes it a harder, harder no. It takes no out of the equation a little bit. You know, institutions of government are are different around the world, right? With our own government and our own capacities in our country to be able to manage resources is at one level. Um, but in in you know third world countries and some places uh, that are a bit more impoverished. Um, you know, it's possible that you have to rethink what is what is what is possible in space. And, you know, a rising tide. Here you go. Here's your analogy. A rising tide lifts all boats. Right. Uh, and if we're able to provide um, and, and work within those communities and the communities themselves see the the advantage to increasing their own livelihoods, sustainable action, then, 
you know, it's more likely to be successful. We just have to be cautious. We can't, we can't ride in on our white horses and, and tell everybody that we know how to solve the problems. We really need to get there and learn from the communities what, what are the solutions that will be best for their situation. Oh, definitely. There's a, I think there's a good, a funny conservation story where in this valley in Africa, these, you know, these Westerners came in, they're like, this is great. You could, you could plant corn here, whatever, whatever the crop is. It'd do so well here. And, and, the, and the locals were just like, they, they, like they were, the Westerners were surprised the locals weren't already taking advantage of it. And so they were just like, oh, those guys are probably stupid. So they just planted a bunch of corn. And then it it it, it floods, <laughs> so so it flooded out all the corn. And then the, they're like locals, like why didn't you tell us? It's like you didn't ask. <laughs> There's a reason we don't do this. So it's like the locals know what's up, and so having them involved so that you know things can go well is always really important. And well, so, some some I think about like uh, so you have like I don't know why I keep thinking deforestation, but like. Uh, when you take too much of the fish resources, you said it so many times. I keep thinking deforestation, where like the fish go away because you overfishing. You overfish it. You have a little playing little word association there to find the right word. When you overfish uh, an area and then you add regulation or like good practices is in, so you don't take too much. Is it possible to take from the system in a manageable way so the fishermen are happy and and women fisher people and but at the same time like have the population grow in a significant way to get it back to like pre pre gathering levels is that like a is it possible to balance that absolutely absolutely and, you know we have great examples of that all around the world um, i think off the coast of california we can look at rockfish uh, which uh you know, was was overfished, and then uh, working with fishers and uh, through processes, um, you know, it's a it's a sustainable fishery now. So, absolutely, there's there's ways uh, there's ways to make things work. I think we can look at Alaska. Uh, a number of Alaskan fisheries are, are doing really well uh, because of of uh, uh, you know the, the working together between the the fisheries communities and the regulators to to come up with best solutions and you know you end up with a healthy thriving uh fisheries and, and economies because of that so absolutely and one of the things we need to think about too is um uh, is aquaculture uh or farm to fish we fish is is really kind of the last wild capture uh part of our diet right um uh, no one you know no one eats uh at commercial and industrial scales venison or anything like that um you know, fish and seafood are really the only things that we go out into the wild and capturing back onto our tables, right? Um, and right now, pretty much our wild capture fisheries are maxed out. Um, we're not really getting much more out of out of than we are. Um, there's a little possibility of expanding fisheries, but for the most part, we are are tapped out of pulling anything else out of the ocean. And so, aquaculture is really the only way to be able to, to grow fisheries to be able to sustain the population growth that we're, we're seeing on the planet right now. And if we could make that shift, if we could, you know, utilize more of our ocean space for aquaculture, sustainable, well-managed aquaculture, uh, and we could maybe even reduce some of our reliance on protein from land-based sources like, um, you know, beef, pork, chicken, that would be a huge benefit to the environment. Uh, you know, the amount of energy and, and resource that goes into producing uh, meat like uh, beef and poultry and, and pig pork is incredible. Uh, and the amount of resource that goes into raising fish is, is really minimal in comparison. So, you know, it's, it's a hugely it's a huge opportunity uh, all around if we could find ways to better manage and increase uh, our capacity to farm uh, ocean fishes. Um, it would be it would be a great benefit to the world. It would be really sad to be the last, right? Like to be the generation that sees the last of something, and we're already doing that, right? Like so, yeah. Which is really sad, you know. Like if if you can't pass the buck anymore, when by the time you're old or one of us is old, I don't know. Um, we look back and like, oh, remember when there was penguins or these types of porpoises and stuff? And it's like, I don't. Yeah, I'm gonna like I wouldn't want to be a part of that. So like, even if it's better to be a part of the team. And do your best and maybe not work out as best as you want it to, but still works and does something well versus, you know, sit on the sidelines and then seeing how bad it gets. Yeah, that's uh, that's how we started this. Extinction is a real thing and it's driven by us, by our actions. So understanding that and, and working to reduce our impacts so that, um, you know, more species have a chance to thrive. Um, that, 
that's a that's a goal. I think there was a study or something coming out that like we're in like a fifth extinction event or something like that. Maybe it's yeah. like it's that bad. Like it's that, that bad. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, as a species that's only been around here a couple hundred thousand years, like you know, credit where credits due. <laughs> now yep. we got now we got to stop it. <laughs> uh, so with the porpoises, kind of bring it all around. If yeah. if nothing changes in five years, I mean. With the things that are going on currently, how are things going to look in like five years that popular? Right. So our, you know, part of that AZA Safe program was to, to try to find different ways of being able to conserve the species. And, and one of the ways we hope to achieve that was through uh, captive conservation. It's called ex situ conservation. Uh, we went down to the upper Gulf, did our best to collect as many vaquita as we could to bring them into protected sanctuary. That didn't work out. Vaquita... Um, are just a species that that don't adapt to human care at all, uh, and it, it didn't work out for us. Um, so that leaves us with the only opportunity being to find a way to keep fishermen from going out onto the sea to uh, catch their livelihood illegally. And the only way to do that, in my opinion, with the communities, to help them to develop new alternative gear strategies, uh, which are happening right now, so that these well-meaning, hard-working men and women in the upper Gulf can earn their living for themselves and their family and do so in a sustainable way. The best way that we can do that to support them is when that product comes out is to spend a little bit of extra money, look for it, buy it, and support that conservation in that way. Support the people of San Felipe, El Golfo de Santa Clara, and Puerto Peñasco by buying seafood products that come out of those areas that are, that are done so in a sustainable way. Uh, Hopefully in the next year, those seafood products will be available. People can look for them. Um, and, and just generally speaking, I think we need to shift the way we think about the food we eat and not buy cheapest food available. Um, we have to buy the right food, not the cheapest. And that makes sense for those people who have affluence enough to be able to make those choices. So there are people in our own country and in other countries that don't get to make those kinds of choices. So, you know, if you have that capacity, if you can, um, that's that's the types of choices. Well, I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye out for those for the, the, those communities. Is there going to be like a label or or something yeah, that will let people know? Keto friendly, keto safe, something like that. Okay, sweet. That was David Bader, director of education at the Aquarium of the Pacific. We learned about endangered species, the porpoises, what his life is like, what he has done to get to where he is, what we need to do to help ensure that. Many species, many different species don't go extinct. We learned quite a lot in this one. And if you liked anything in particular, please leave a review and let me know. Or send me an email and let me know at learningwithlowell.com. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for joining us today with Learning with Lowell. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell was here, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.